All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kem. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is finally episode 76, and today I will be discussing the annual ferrous sulfate production cycle that was being utilized by the ancient Irish Tua de Danon to ensure an abundant supply of metallic iron for the subsequent generations. I'm sure you all have noticed, but there is about to be a massive influx of a variety of new content and a number of different formats here on the channel very, very soon. So if you haven't already, now is the perfect time to subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button because you do not want to miss what I have coming up in the near future. If you want to help support the channel, just go to thelandofchem.com. You can pick up a limited first edition print copy of the book, grab some Land of Chem merch. Either way, all the orders mean the world to me. Thank you all so much for helping to support this channel. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. So in episode 67, I explained the role of sunlight in the bio-hydro-metallurgical chemistry that was occurring inside of the passage chamber structures across Ireland, such as Newgrange that you can see here, Noth, Locru, and Carrowkeel, all of which I personally visited during my 2018 research expedition to Ireland. And that's right, ladies and gentlemen, I once again put my money where my mouth is and put my boots on the ground to do on-site research to investigate my hypothesis about these ancient Irish stone and earth mounds. And upon my return, my research was corroborated when I discovered this research paper that literally and perfectly described in modern terms with modern laboratory procedures, exactly what I was proposing had occurred inside of these structures, which is that they were loaded with heaps of pulverized powdered marcasite or iron disulfide, FES2. Those heaps of the initial reactant were then exposed to circulating air and water within these oxidation chambers, which gradually transformed the iron disulfide into ferrous sulfate, FESO4, with the assistance of the acidophilic bacteria that naturally occur in the areas where these structures were built. The final conversion of the Fe3 plus ions into Fe2 plus ions was then completed by exposing the ferrous sulfate solution to UV radiation from the sun, which occurred over the several days around the winter solstice, making this an annual production cycle and inevitably contributing to the ritualistic celebrations that occurred around this time of year. Of course, it was a time for celebration and ritual. They had just performed a miraculous transformation that would ensure that their civilization would have the ferrous sulfate for soil conditioning, iron, for everything that they would use for metallic iron, and sulfuric acid for other chemical applications that was required to sustain the population expansion in this new area. And here you can see the product, crystalline ferrous sulfate, an absolutely beautiful chemical, which was one of the primary chemicals being studied, produced, and utilized by the medieval alchemists, who clearly had knowledge of these ancient chemical practices and were attempting to revive this chemical manufacturing tradition. However, they were not using the ferrous sulfate for making metallic iron or improving soil conditions, but rather for producing pure gold. And here, in this image, you can see the green lion, which is an alchemical symbol for ferrous sulfate. And I encourage you all to disregard the superficial spiritual interpretation of these symbols and understand that these depictions are showing chemical reactions. These symbols were disguised as having a spiritual significance to hide their real meaning from the uninitiated public who did not understand that these images were encoded with practical chemistry. So let me explain exactly how to read this image from the perspective of a formula for a chemical reaction sequence. Here at the bottom, you can see a sun with indistinct rays, a symbol for impure gold, partially submerged in what appears to be water. 
This is depicting the process of dissolving gold containing ore into a solution of aqua regia, a mixture of hydrochloric acid and nitric acid that we have discussed before. The pure gold will then dissolve away into that solution, but you need a way to retrieve that gold after it is dissolved, which is a process called precipitation or in the gold refining world referred to as dropping the gold. Enter ferrous sulfate, the green lion, which is an extremely effective at precipitating gold that has been dissolved into a solution of aqua regia. And that is exactly what is depicted here. The green lion or ferrous sulfate is being used to retrieve or drop the gold out of the solution. And you can now see here, the sun's rays are full and vibrant, indicating that a chemical transformation from impure gold into very pure gold has occurred. This is not some image of spiritual resurrection, but rather instructions on how to produce pure gold that was only intended to be fully understood by those who understood the chemistry behind these symbols. And that is exactly what you can see here. The curb stone of Newgrange, a stone carved with mysterious glyphs that the uninitiated have implied are spiritual or magic symbols. Well, they are right in one aspect, in that ancient magic was chemistry, but they lack the knowledge of practical chemistry that would enable them to understand that this is the instruction manual for the operation of these passage chamber mounds, and it literally depicts the full chemical reaction sequence that once occurred within these oxidation chambers. And if you haven't seen that full explanation, I will put a link to episode 67 in the video description below. All right, everyone, just a quick reminder that if you want to support this channel, I need your help now more than ever as I am living in Egypt and doing this full time. So if you already purchased a copy of the book, grab yourself a t-shirt. If you already got a t-shirt, get another one in a different style or a different logo. I have a bunch of new t-shirt designs coming up very, very soon. And don't forget, these are now extremely limited. First edition print copies of the book, The Land of Chem, an initiation into ancient chemistry through the degrees of the Egyptian pyramids. So if you want to help support the channel, just go to thelandofchem.com. You can pick up a t-shirt, a hoodie, long sleeve shirt, grab yourself a copy of the book. Either way, all of the orders mean more to me than words can possibly ever describe. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. All right, now onto my 2018 research expedition and this badass beard that I used to sport and the goal of the annual production cycle of the ancient Irish Tuatadonan, which was to ensure that all of the subsequent generations to follow would have plentiful supply of metallic iron. This is some of the most ancient chemistry on the planet. And these reactions did not occur on the same timeline that we expect today. This process took a long time, and this ancient civilization was not focused on the immediacy of chemical reactions that we have during the modern times. They were doing these reactions to ensure the survival of their civilization for generation after generation. And these people understood how to build structures that worked in harmony with the earth and the natural environment exactly as their later cousins, the Egyptian pyramids, worked in conjunction with the natural forces of the earth. This was a civilization that was more connected to this planet than we could possibly even conceive, and they built structures that operated the exact same way. Enter more acidophilic bacteria and something called bog iron. So I discovered during my 2018 research expedition many connections between the pyramids from Egypt and these ancient passage chamber mounds. And you can see here that there is a visible relationship between these structures, which is exactly what you find in Egypt. That from one structure, you can see the next in the distance. And you can see here, I'm standing on top of the biggest stone and earth mound at Noth. And you can see here in the distance, Newgrange, a visible connection on the landscape itself. And as I began to explore all of these sites, I realized that they were all built on hills or cliffs that are surrounded by large areas of bogs. And you can see here the spectacular site of Karokil, one of the most amazing places that I have ever been. And you park your car here and hike 
all the way up this cliff to get to the monuments on the very top. And one of the great things about exploring Ireland is that with the exception of Newgrange and Noth, all of these sites are accessible without tour groups. You have to find them on your own, get there by yourself, and that is exactly what I did. When you get to the very top of the Cliffs of Carrowkeel, and believe it or not, my last name means cliff or ridge in Gaelic, you will find these three extremely ancient stone mounds, which all have a very similar internal configuration, a passage, three ancillary chambers within the vaulted central chamber. So here is what I am proposing was happening. These chambers were loaded early in the year with the iron disulfide reactant and left to oxidize within these chambers all year. As you may know, Ireland has a very rainy season and this natural precipitation was integrated into the production cycle. Exactly as I have hypothesized that the flooding of the Nile River was integrated into the chemical reaction methodology of the ancient Egyptians. I literally got to experience this for myself as when I was inside of one of these chambers, a massive rainstorm started and not only intense airflow, but water began flooding into the chambers. So I crawled out through the water and was partially soaked when I got out. But I finally saw in real time exactly how these things work. Coincidentally, for those of you who believe in coincidence, as soon as the light bulb went off in my head, the sun broke through the clouds and began to illuminate the bogs at the bottom of the hill. This experience was included into the final chapter of the book and is one of my favorite moments of the entire story. The next few pictures came from Google, but they are showing iron oxide deposits inside of an iron bog. So here's what happens naturally in a bog. Water rich with iron ions, mostly in the form of ferrous sulfate, flows into these bogs and the naturally occurring acidophilic bacteria, as mentioned earlier, gradually transform these iron ions into deposits of iron oxide and you can see here the reddish brown orange coloration from these iron oxide deposits. Over time, these deposits form clumps of bog iron, which you can see here, that can be collected and smelted to render metallic iron. So this process happens naturally with no assistance whatsoever. And these iron bogs can be harvested generationally, a process that is well documented in the historical record. So I am proposing that the ancient Tuatodonon, with their magic and sophisticated understanding of the natural world and chemistry, assisted this process by building structures to make even more ferrous sulfate, which was then leached out from inside of these chambers by rainwater and carried into the bogs. More ferrous sulfate in the bogs means more iron can be harvested. And by performing this annual chemical production ritual, they were able to ensure a plentiful supply of metallic iron could be harvested from these bogs by the later generations. They literally harnessed the power of nature to work in conjunction with these structures to facilitate the chemical reaction process. And yeah, it happened on a much longer time frame than what you might have expected. But I have never once said that any of this happened quickly. This is ancient chemistry, ladies and gentlemen, and this civilization thought and acted much further into the future than we do today, much to our detriment, as we can see now with non-biodegradable plastics, environmental pollution, etc. However, this was a civilization that lasted much longer than any modern civilization ever had. Just think of the advances we have made in the last 300 years here in the United States. Moving from a civilization with no electricity and horse-drawn buggies to now iPhones, 5G, and electric cars. So you don't think this ancient civilization could have made improvements over the thousands and thousands of years on these chemical reactions to expedite the process? Of course they did. And I will be explaining some simple modifications that I believe were made that drastically shortened this process and the function of some other structures that are found all across Ireland that would have eliminated the natural bog iron transformation process. And I truly believe that this is the same knowledge of the forces of earth 
and of chemistry that eventually became what we see in the Egyptian pyramids. And I will close on this image of a stone carved into the shape of a pyramid, absolutely spectacular, that I found inside one of the chambers at Karokil. There is so much more to all of this, ladies and gentlemen, so please subscribe and stay tuned. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 76, The Green Lion of Ancient Ireland. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. And now that I'm settled here in Egypt, where do you think my first annual research expedition will be? That's right, ladies and gentlemen, back to Ireland for some exclusive on-site investigations of the ancient passage chamber structures all across the country. So if you haven't already, now is the perfect time to subscribe to the Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification button because you do not want to miss the content that I have coming up very, very soon. If you want to help support the channel, you know what to do. Thelandofchem.com. Pick up some merch, a book. Either way, I really appreciate the support. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's video. So I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.